welcome Amy and Rob to Out of the Mouths. Thank you so much for coming today to share your experience in foster care. And we're just so excited to hear your, your wisdom and all you've been through since becoming foster parents. So why don't we start by telling us all a little bit about yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm Amy. I'm Rob. We've been married 13 years. We have three children. We homeschool them. Rob is retired military. As well as homeschooling, and I'm a professional artist, and I teach art lessons and um, commission artwork. And we were first time foster parents, a year and a half of fostering, um, got to go through a reunification process. So, first time foster parents, and you've done a pretty traditional placement mm -hmm. where reunification was the goal. Mm -hmm. And so, let's back up a little bit, and I wanted to know how you started with foster care, what was it that made you even want to become foster parents? For me, I would say fostering was something that was always on my heart, even as a child. And it probably was because of where I grew up with neighbors who fostered. And so that was my first exposure to fostering. Um, and then through my teen years, um, I got to actually know a few other families that fostered and the relationship with those children and then in our early early um, years of marriage where I was working um, I ended up having a lot of foster kids come into the facility I was working at and I got to work with them and so it was kind of something that definitely was like okay one of these days I'm going to be a foster mom but I didn't know when that day would be and so, and honestly, in your head, you think, okay, when I have it all together, I will be a foster mom. So when God actually made the call, I wrestled a little bit with like, are you sure this is really the time? <laughs> so, so it, and, um, but you know, God is very clear when he calls you to something, um, no matter how much you wrestle, um, you can't avoid him. <laughs> so his time was perfect. And so we are very glad we listened when he made that call. And it would have been now, Three, I did just go mad. It was two years before we got our placement, so about three and a half years ago that um, I started to feel the tug really, really strong that it's time. <laughs> go get licensed. <laughs> yeah. And for you, Rob, how did that yeah. transpire to you? Um, it started with, did it start in Amy time? It's, I, I never thought about fostering until Amy brought it, but when we started going to HPC, um, since they have a strong emphasis on fostering, I didn't realize how great the need was, so that that opened my eyes when HPC uh, presented how great the need was. And then the more I thought about it, I realized you can't be pro-life without being willing to help those who uh, chose life. So That's a really good point. That's a very good point. So God kind of worked in your hearts simultaneously? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That gets that point? Definitely. Great, great. So how was the licensing part of this process for you guys? For us, it was like a high-speed train. Um, so I know for some people it takes longer, but for us, when we um, went approach Boys Town um, for licensing, um, they were just able to get things really, really quickly. And the season, God like worked it out in our in our life seasonally that we could go through each step and get it done pretty efficiently. And so I did find it. There were moments through the licensing that I felt fear creep up because as you're going to the classes and you're hearing different stories and profiles, um, it can scare you a little bit. It kind of makes it look like this really scary thing. And um, that, that probably, there was a moment where I was like, what am I doing? I need breaks on this. Um, but then um, God spoke to me very, very clearly gave me a very strong sign, you know, if you're going to go forward, you're going to trust me in this. And I'm really glad I did because it, it was after that two months exactly that we had our first, our placement came into our home. And so I found it neat that as I got closer and closer to the licensing finishing, the fear got stronger and stronger and stronger, but I'm so glad I didn't let fear lead me and that I took that step of faith and just um, continued forward with it and completed it because it was the day our license was finished that we got the call with our placement. And so on the same day, we got 
a message, um, congratulations, your licensing is complete. <laughs> a few hours later, we have a little one for you. Do you want to take him? <laughs> so we're like, okay, God, your hand has been on this. Like you knew, you know, um, and they even said it, our agency said, we don't often see it happen that quickly, but God knew the day that particular child was going to meet us. And so his hand was even on the license in the process of how fast it happened. So, yeah. For you, Rob, did you feel like it was also a quick process and have some roller coaster of emotions? It, or? it did seem pretty quick, but I mean, it went relatively smoothly. We did learn a lot taking that tip smash class, but, but there were some scary stories with all the, a lot of bad cases there. So you, I was worried more about our three biological children. We wanted to protect them too, but with, the peace of God, you know, he could get us through anything. So. Now, after you can look back and at your training and what you learned in those classes and how you actively put them into practice, are there things from that licensing time, that, that training time that you feel really benefited you? For me, it benefited when it comes to empathy because they do a really good job of giving you an understanding of where these kids are coming from and why you're dealing with certain behaviors. And it's very easy to just focus on the bad behavior and not look at what's behind the bad behavior. So for me, I think it made me a smarter parent because it gave me a bigger picture of like, wait a minute, there's a root behind this. I'll have a lot more grace towards <laughs> certain behaviors. So that training I found to be extremely helpful just giving a clearer understanding of, you know, background and that trauma and causes of certain traumas. And then, um, but there were things too that I feel like no matter how much training you have, you're going to learn a lot <laughs> of new things when the kid comes and learn along the way because every person is unique and every case is unique. And I don't think they can train you for all of them. The training, was, it prepared us for a lot. The one thing that I didn't realize so much because it didn't come in China. It says how much you're fostering the kid, but you're also fostering their biological family. I didn't, I didn't realize how much you're going to be dealing with the, the kid's actual parents. I thought it would be more separated, but it's like you have, you have the foster kid and you have like foster parents that you're having to guide along the way. You have to give them parenting tips and help them as, just, almost as much as you help their, you're helping their kid. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. And what was your experience like working with the state? Mm -hmm. So you're in a small state. Yeah. Um, do you, did you feel like they were a support to you or mm -hmm. how, how was that experience for you working with the state? So there were definitely positive things and negative things. So first of all, our state is small. Yes. Um, but yeah, we live on the southern part of our state and we often felt like when we needed help with like transportation or stuff, it was so inconvenient because we were so far out from where a lot of kids come from the city and stuff. And um, so that was something that <laughs> they were suddenly acting like our small state was so big. I don't know, but that was frustrating. I felt that um, there were things they could do better. I'm not going to lie. I definitely do. There were a lot of things that I thought, right, they're not helping where they said they would help in, in the training. They definitely, in the training, had you under the impression that there would be a lot more support. And then once we were fostering, we realized that there was a lot that we had to actively do ourselves in order to get that support. They do not willingly just hand it out to you. You really have to knock very hard <laughs> to get it. Um, you kind of feel that the state is so overwhelmed, but that could also be part of the problem. Um, they're so overwhelmed that a lot of things you would bring up, you feel are forgotten. So you have to repeat yourself a lot with them. So we did learn to be very proactive. <laughs> like, what are our needs? We have to be very loud about them. Um, and also, um, I do have a lot of grace for them too, though, because they are overwhelmed. So you, you, I didn't, I'm not an angry person. I never was like so mad at them. Like, why aren't they doing this? They said they would do that. Like, I always be like, well, they have their hands full with a lot of kids that they're trying to, in cases that they're managing so we can get through this, you know, and find another way, you know, not depend so much on their assistance and help. But, um, 
so yeah, that was kind of, I would say, I would say though, one thing that I did notice, I was blessed by what I saw DCYF do for the foster child and their parent. I thought they did a lot of good for them. I actually saw them offer so much. And for me, it actually blessed me. I was like, wow, I didn't even know that they offer certain things that they do or um, for families that have children in foster care to help them succeed and actually get their feet on the ground. So that blessed me. Um, I thought, okay, my tax dollars are doing a good thing here. So I'm not going to lie. So yeah, that was something that um, we learned and I was happy with. Great. So another big piece of the puzzle mm-hmm. here for you guys is you have your biological children. Mm-hmm. You have three other children. Um, how do you feel the experience overall was for for the kids? Positive. I'm going to say very positive. Mm-hmm. Um, you would agree, right? I agree. They love, they fell in love with our foster son. And um, and honestly, I, I think that they're better people because of it. Um, I've seen them sacrifice a lot for that one person when it comes to their mother and her time, um, their schedule, and they never, they they would sometimes complain like there was very open communication and we would be able to have a very healthy dialogue about it. They never resented their foster brother ever. They loved him. They played with him. They treated him equally. They just took him in as a family member and, um, that not one of them are traumatized even after the reunification. So for us, um, we're very thankful that it was a positive experience for them. And I think, though, even while we were in training, our open communication with them about what to expect really helped. And I, I think that's really important because they are doing it with you. It's not just mom and dad. The kids are doing it with you. And so um, after trainings, we would talk about things with them and get them prepared. and. Um, and even while we were going through certain things, we would talk about the whys and um, give them that vision of like, okay, how is this serving God? You know, how are we being like Jesus right now? Um, and that helped them because they all do have a heart's desire to like, okay, I want to do this for Christ. You know, so there's a lot of selflessness that is involved um, for the whole family, and we saw that in them. And um, I will say that. Um, different children have very different relationships with that child. And so um, I think certain ones are probably grieving more losing him than others. I think others um, are more like, okay, like one of our children are like, when are we getting the next one? I want to do it again. Like they're all about the mission. And the other one is just like, I wish we never lost that child. You know, I want to keep him forever. So they all have very, um, different responses, I think, to it, but not are, none are negative, I would say. That's good. Yeah. yeah. I think it does. We often have to create mm-hmm. scenarios where our children can be selfless, yes. especially in the culture that we yeah. live in, where it's yeah. a self-focused culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So foster care does do that for our family yes. if it's done well. I also noticed, too, I think it opened our kids' eyes to appreciate what they have because um, I transported a lot, and so they got to see very up close the environment that their foster sibling was coming from, and it made them realize not everyone has what they have, and it made them appreciate it more. And I think that's so healthy and important to see that, you know. And so that was a blessing too, and also to think of those um, that are least than you. You know, it got them thinking outside of their little world. <laughs> That's really um, a good thing to be able to offer them while you raise them. So, and it's funny because one of the things that I wrestled with with God when He had called us, I was like, "I'm raising my own children right now. I'm in the thick of it. I'm homeschooling elementary. You know, how on earth could I ever balance that?" But it has, the timing was so perfect because in even shaping and molding my own children, it was a huge piece in creating the people that they're meant to grow up to be and so I actually think there are so many benefits to fostering young children while you're raising your own children and that healthy family dynamic 
is so healthy for those kids because they have they have peers in the home with them. Like I think it our foster son benefited so much from having siblings. And, you know, it just was it was it was really worth it. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Rob, do you think that there were any um, boundaries or rules you put in place when it came to what type of child, uh, age group, boy or girl? Like, did you guys have any um, guidelines that you went by that would protect your own children? We just uh, we just wanted younger than our youngest so that the birth order would remain intact because we didn't want some kid older than our youngest coming in almost skipping. I didn't want him to feel like he was skipped over or so I mean mm -hmm. then DCUF did a good job. Our placement was younger than our youngest, so mm -hmm. it, everything worked out with that. Yeah. But I, I, we didn't have a boundary with male or female though, did we? No, I mean, as long as they age, were younger, yeah. yeah, it was age. So our biggest boundary was the age and it was we didn't want to break the birth order in the home and we thought that was really um, important. And, and in our training, they recommended that as well. They think that's um, always healthy. And then um, I think too, after fostering, we even realized so much more how important it, <laughs> it is to stay and keep that boundary. Um, we were just recently talking with our agency about our next placement and they're, they're like, oh, you want older? And I'm like, no, I, I, it was perfect for us to have a, a new younger sibling come in and be the baby of the family. Um, I think all of our kids were able to be healthy role models in that way too. And so um, we're gonna, that's our biggest um, boundary. So now that you've gone through the whole process, mm -hmm. you've been trained, got your first placement, you went through the ups and downs of visits mm -hmm. and um, was there any back and forth with the state about if this little one was going to go home if they they weren't can you talk more about that emotional piece of it through the journey because it was a year and a half mm -hmm. that you had this one and he did end up being unified mm -hmm. which is um, a rare thing yeah. sometimes in foster care mm -hmm. for it to happen that long, that long after a placement yeah. so yeah let's share some more about like the emotional part of that as the journey went on so right when he came to us um, and they shared the details of the case, we knew it, it was a highly probable reunification. Um, within the first six months, they made it feel like it was a lot more imminent. And that was emotionally hard because the caseworker was constantly talking very optimistically about within the next month, the next two months. You know, I want to see you reunified, and every month kept going by, and you're trying to prepare yourself for that, and him, and and it kept dragging out. We did get to a point where, like, they keep talking about this, but I don't see how it can actually happen. Like, if you want to, then and then, and like, what are we doing? Um, so that's emotionally draining um, because you're getting very mixed messages, and. Um, you're trying to prepare yourself for that and and the longer they're with you the more established they're feeling with you and that was I think the really hard part because he had dug really deep roots with us and um he was kind of being tossed back and forth and for a while splitting his week with us and his mom and he was feeling restless because of that and so and um and the bond was getting obviously a lot stronger, I think. And when he's so young and developing in these major milestone years, <laughs> it was hard. It, it was harder on him. And that was harder for me to watch it be really hard on him. And so, and we, he made so many developmental milestones while with us too. And so, and I'm glad like the longer he was with us, I'm actually very thankful because he was able to develop certain things with us, a good, you know, healthy habits. And I'm like, okay, they'll last with him longer because he was with us that long and he's a little bit older now. So I feel like certain things are going to stick with him. So that was a good thing. I know even the extended, you know, back and forth of not knowing when he was going to reunify, it was equally hard on his mother. Um, but one thing that really helped was that her and I had established very early on a healthy relationship with one another. Um, I was told 
in the beginning of the case, I was told, you know, mom's good, mom's safe, build a relationship with her. You can feel safe to give her your phone number. And even this is something they advocate a lot for in the training. And I was actually very um, hesitant towards that. I'm not going to lie. I really had thought that I would always allow the state to be the middleman and I would never like have a one-on-one conversation with a birth parent because in my head I thought all birth parents were abusers and criminals and all, you know the worst of the worst and something that I learned very quickly through our case is that sometimes you actually a lot of times it can be simple things as poverty or single parenting or um, just people who have some very unfortunate hard circumstances they've been thrown into where they can't be good parent right now and um but they do want to and so you see the state is really trying to help a lot of those people you know and um so when i after a couple weeks of having a replacement i decided okay i do want to meet her and that was the best thing we could have done um it gave her so much peace in mind because this is her child that she truly loves with strangers she was just as fearful and scared as I was. So we were both, you know, being both vulnerable in vulnerable positions. And um, when she um, met me and saw my face, she just felt so much more peace. And, and then from that day forward, we were able to build a relationship of trust with one another. And um, knowing that her child was in our each other's best interest, you know, and, um, and when it came time to reunify him, um, it really helped her because all her fear, she was able to come to me with them and I could encourage her and kind of just really cheer for her and him to succeed. Um, she never had to feel like I was trying to steal her son from her. And I think a lot of birth parents, unfortunately, struggle with that. Like this foster family is here to steal my kid from me. They hate me. They think I'm the worst person in the world. They're above me. But we really had a goal to make sure that um, she, She never felt like we were in it to take her child. Uh, We were in it to love him, care for him, but also help her. (laughs) So, but um, that helped all of us. I think everybody, both parties, with the reunification. And because of that, um, she was able to say, I want to keep you in our lives forever. It is the best thing for all of us. And so we have continued to see them and so, um, and talk with them and, you know, help them when there's been a a struggle or um, when she's been stuck in a corner and needs help. I've been there. And I think that's huge because people need community. And so um, we wanted to be that community for them. We didn't want to just be in it, these people that love him, and then we're removed and he never sees us again. No, we wanted him to build a healthy attachment and then know that these people are actually still there cheering me on or a voice of encouragement or you know, constantly, even our last get together, um, when he told me you're scared and I just said, you're a brave little boy, you know, and I'm proud of you and you've had to do scary things. You know, it's not easy living in two homes. And so, um, I'm thankful he reunified. Um, I think a lot of people, the, the question we got asked the most, and it's, it's an annoyance because everyone asks it and they're like, Oh, you foster you're going to adopt him. He belongs with you. And it's like all of that. And it's like, we were not in it to adopt. We were always in it to help, you know, foster. And we're like, you know what? It can still be good. Even if he reunifies and it can still be good. Um, Cause God, God knows his story. Right. And if I went into it, like he has to be mine. It's only good if he stays with me. It's a very selfish mindset, but um, we went into it with open hands. And I think that's just so much healthier all around. And um, he can be okay, you know, when he's reunified. But I think it's how you, the steps you take even after he's reunified that can even help and benefit their future going forward. And so um, I'm thankful that um, we have a relationship with mom and that she can trust us now even um, after it's funny. It's like, she even said that she goes, you know, he gained a family. So she's like, I will forever see you as his family. And that means a lot. And so he went from an only child and he is with her, but now he does still have a family with us. And so um, that's a blessing. <laughs> yeah. 
And Rob, how was your, um, so dads are often overlooked in this process, <laughs> often with um, in birth families, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe dad's not involved or they're separated. Sometimes they are. Um, what was your experience being the dad in this situation? And for you, you guys personally, this placement, this was a single mom, mm -hmm. right? Dad, what birth dad was somewhat involved, somewhat not. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. And so how was your experience coming along as foster dad for this little guy mm -hmm. who didn't have a present dad in the home? It was good. I mean, I didn't I treated him just like my, my other kids, so I didn't treat him any different. So he got the same fathering stuff that my other kids did. So hopefully that helped him because I know he didn't have much of a father figure at home, so Hopefully, I was a good father figure for him here at least, and this is such a good example. So, something he knows to look for. It was the cutest thing. He would get so excited when Rob would come home. <laughs> He'd hear the truck, Daddy's home! And, and he would stare at the stairs and jump. And it, you see that need for a father figure so mm -hmm. strongly because he did really strongly gravitate um, to Rob. And so it it was crucial that relationship in his life because he, he really was um, the only true real father figure he had. So and now you can maintain that. Yes. That role yeah. To a degree. Yeah. You're not dad, but right. Just another strong. healthy, strong male figure. It's true in his life. <laughs> so, good. so good. So a lot of the things that you have to deal with as a foster parent is how your own family uh, receives or doesn't receive you being foster parents, mm -hmm. uh, your community, um, whether that's supportive or not supportive. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's just like things that people assume about foster mm -hmm. parents. So you get kind of the same questions all the time or the same comments all the time. What are some of those comments that you would hear over and over mm -hmm. again as a foster parent that maybe you could dispel some myths about foster care? So it was really interesting. So at HPC, the environment is so supportive. It's amazing. You know, it's very pro-foster, very pro-adoption. Um, you have a great support there. But then when it comes to the rest of your community outside of that, people have a lot of hesitation. And so you find that you get most the, like from our parents when we had brought it up, their concern was, it's going to be hard. And I don't want you to do something hard. And I sure be really hard when you have to let them go back and um they kind of try to almost scare you out of it a little bit it's, it's so um and then a lot of people make comments about how i don't know how you do that i don't know how you do that you're so good to do that you're a saint to do that and then it's oh, do you want to adopt? Like you would only do that if you're looking to adopt. <laughs> so um, I would say the mindset, the majority of people is a very self-focused mindset of like only, only a certain type of person is made for that and you shouldn't do it because it's too risky, it's too dangerous, it's too emotional. And is it hard? Yes. Is it draining? Yes. Is it worth it 100%? Because as for us as Christians, like Robert said, um, first of all, we're pro-life. You know, what greater way to live the example of it than helping those in need? But for me, it's Matthew 25 that comes to mind when Jesus says, where were you when I was naked? Where were you when I was hungry, when I was in prison, when I was sick? Um, for me, that's the image of fostering. You know, we are blessed children of God, we have a home and over our head, why not take in a child in need? <laughs> you know, for us, it there seemed like no excuse not to. Um, and any excuse that you would have would be selfish and that's not Jesus. And so um, if you're looking, he was truly the drive behind it, you know, to serve him and the strength in it, like when it's hard, he is our strength, you know, when, when I don't know what to do or when I'm sad, I, he would bring my focus back, you know, to, to the why, why am I doing this? I'm doing this for him. I'm doing this for an, another so that another can feel love so that another can experience Christ's love, you know, and, uh, we really saw that, um, 
And we, it was told to us by the birth parent that they were an atheist until they met us, that they are convinced that there has to be a higher being out there because they had never experienced love like they had experienced with us before. And I'm like, what a powerful testimony that is because it could seem like you're not doing very much, but to them, they've never had anyone do a selfless act for them. And so something as simple as, you know, picking them up and giving them a ride is huge. And that's an an opportunity for them to experience Jesus Christ. And so it it doesn't always even have to just be you preaching at them. It's the active things that you are doing with your life and your time for these people that most people forget about and don't think about. Um, That is the greatest witness of Jesus to them. Um, yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So it doesn't take a saint. No, it takes obedience. It takes obedience. <laughs> yes, and humility. Humility and love and kindness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to wrap up, I mm-hmm. want to offer the opportunity for everybody on our channel, mm-hmm. not only to express from your own mouths mm-hmm. what your experience was like, but mm-hmm. going forward. There are so many um, organizations out there that help mm-hmm. foster families, adoptive families, the children in care. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you have one that's kind of special and near to your, dear to your heart that you want to um, give a little spotlight to? And um, if anybody wants to donate to them, mm-hmm. you can share what that is. Mm-hmm. So we're licensed through Boys Town. Um, they're a wonderful agency. Um, we love them because they've been so supportive. I find they're very helpful um, and supportive and even in training um, for foster parents, but um, also as far as ministries, bags of hopes, like for a charity, I think what they do is beautiful for the children because they create a bag with like a duffel bag that has a child's name embroidered on it. And then they personally like stuff them with things for that child and these children, they don't, come with a lot. they don't come with a lot. Like when we got our placement, he came with just a, you know, a, a grocery bag with a couple of things in it. And for them to be able to have a bag that's theirs, fill the stuff for them, and then they can take it home with them, you know. And um, it's those little things that actually are really big things. And so um, and they hand deliver those bags to all those kids. And so. I highly, highly recommend um, sponsoring one of their bags. And it's only, I think, $25 to sponsor a bag. It's, so um, <laughs> if you had to do it's very little to do something very big for a child, very doable. And so they're a beautiful ministry. Great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom. Mm-hmm. And um, thank you, Rob, for your service. We appreciate all of your selfless acts. Mm -hmm. You've done so much, and we know that the Lord will strengthen you and guide you to Mm -hmm. do the next thing he's calling you to do. (laughs) Thank you guys so much. Thank Thank you. you.